With Book 6 of Fire Emblem Heroes' as main story returning to an Asker vs. Embla plotline, I thought now would be a good time to go through all the lore from the main story. I wanted to go over the entire main story from Book 1 through 5 myself, and like pretty much all my videos, I want to share my findings. If you don't like reading, or if you want a refresher since Faye has been out for almost 5 years now, then hopefully this series of videos can help you out. As the title states, this video will be for Book 1, but I plan to cover everything up to Book 5 in separate videos. Because lore can be tedious, I'm also thinking of releasing videos in between each book on other fun topics. For example, after we talk about book 2, I do want to cover the Ice and Flame Tempest Trials plot. If any of this interests you, hopefully you stick around and I'll try to put these videos out when we don't have any other Fey news going on. Alright, enough introduction, let's hit the books. Fire Emblem Heroes kicks off with Anna, the franchise's favorite recurring character, greeting the player as a great hero. She is a commander of the Order of Heroes and she performed a summoning ceremony in desperation to ask for help. The Order of Heroes is a group from the Nation of Asker who believe heroes should live free. Meanwhile, Asker's enemy, the Nation of Embla, enslaves those heroes. Anna states that the Emblem Empire is attacking Asker and she used the divine relic Bradablick to summon the player. When Anna explains the situation, they are attacked by Emblem soldiers and Anna hands us the Bradablick. It glows with light and we summon our first hero, much to Anna's surprise. She says no one else in the order can summon heroes. We next meet up with Alphonse, who is the Prince of Asker and a member of the Order. He greets the player, which I will now refer to as the Summoner, and tells Anna about a strange masked man he spotted. After a skirmish, the gang run into this masked man, who is uncooperative. He does mention closing gateways before leaving, and Anna explains that the gateways connect their world to the worlds of all the heroes. Those of Asker and royalty, like Alphonse, can open gateways while the royals of Embla can close them. The two nations are supposed to work in harmony to open and close gateways, but at some point Embla decided to leave the gates open. Asker can't close the gates and Embla has invaded those worlds, which leaves the nations in their current conflict. The Order of Heroes was formed to fight against Embla's invasions. Alphonse, Anna, and the Summoner make their way to the World of Mystery, where they meet Shirena. Shirena is Alphonse's younger sister, the Princess of Asker, and another member of the Order of Heroes. She tells the group that the Amblians have taken control of a hero called Minerva, who is under contract with a certain Princess Veronica. We never get concrete details about how contracts from Embla work, but it seems implied the Summoner has a similar contract system when they summon heroes. Regardless, defeating Minerva is enough to free her from her contract. As it turns out, Minerva was just a distraction and Embla is invading Asker itself. We meet Princess Veronica of Embla in the flesh and she calls upon Xander to fight us. The Asker gang win the fight, Veronica retreats, and we head into Book 1's first chapter. The launch of Fire Emblem Heroes featured 9 chapters in the main story of Book 1, but it's generally bare bones with some chapters having almost no major plot progression. In Book 1 typically we meet various heroes from different Fire Emblem games and they tell us they have to fight us because they're under contract with Veronica. We defeat them to break their contracts and that's generally about it. The first year of Faye had a pretty wonky system for the main story, it involves 13 chapters in book 1, but it also includes paralogues and xenologues with important plot points. I'm only going to cover important events, but I'll keep track of where we are with the name of each stage. In chapter 1, all that really happens is we meet and fight Marth in the Road of Mystery. In chapter 2, we face off against Xander once again. Once we defeat him for good, instead of breaking free of his contract, Xander willingly decides to stay by Princess Veronica's side. This is an unusual occurrence, but Alphonse states it isn't so different from heroes deciding to help Asker of their own free will. In chapter 3, the Asker trio want to know a bit more about the Summoner and ask what their world is like. The Summoner tells them about skyscrapers and cars, which confuses them. Anna mentions she's never heard of a world like that. Skipping to chapter 5, we get a bit more info about the powers of Asker and Emblo from Alphonse and Shirena. They state that the royal powers are meant to work in tandem, although it's never mentioned what exactly the Askerans and Amblians did in those worlds. Until one of them gets both powers or they work together with Veronica, the war is going to continue. Chapter 6 has the gang facing Prince Roma, and once Roma is defeated, the Asker Trail mentioned one of their lost friends, Zacharias, and explains Zacharias was a member of the Order who disappeared one day. They searched for him, but they could never find him. In Chapter 7, we get more info about Zacharias, who was apparently childhood friends with Alphonse and Shirena. They mentioned he was a skilled lancer, a loyal friend, and they had lost contact with him in the Word of Awakening. With the summoner around, the gang decide to search for Zacharias one last time. 
In the World of Awakening, the Asker gang aren't able to find any clues about Zacharias. Sharena mentions that he was the one who taught her about lances and wonders if they'll ever get to see him again. Alphonse is also distraught with the lack of clues, but Anna states Zacharias was her responsibility as the commander of the Order of Heroes. Anna does her best to make sure everyone tries to stay focused on their next fight. In Chapter 9, Embla is once again marching on Asker. The gang finally meet the masked man from the preface, and he states he is neither with Embla or Asker. After beating him in a fight, the masked man tells Alphonse that uh, Veronica isn't after Asker's capital, but she's gonna destroy their summoning ruins to stop the summoner's powers. The gang is suspicious, but Alphonse feels the masked man wasn't lying. They're able to cut off Veronica in time and chase her off. We get to learn a good bit about Veronica and Embla from the Asker trio. They tell us that Veronica's late father was the previous emperor of Embla, and he was very popular with the Emblem people, but warred with Asker by hoarding heroes. He died at some point, and Embla declared peace with Asker. The crown went to the Empress, but she's not actually Veronica's mother. Veronica is the daughter of the Emperor and his first wife, the previous Empress. Eventually, Veronica started to invade worlds like her father, and she gained the support of the Amblin people, who now see her as the true heir. Before the gang returns to the castle, they are met by the masked man. He tells the gang that they can stop searching for Zacharias, and they'll never see him again. Anna stops Alphonse from chasing after him, but the gang now have a lead about Zacharias, even if it's all a trap. This concludes the launch chapters, and the main story now jumps between chapters 10 to 13, Paralogues, and Xenologues. In Xenologue 1, The Detached Princess, we start with Veronica threatening Ephraim to do her bidding, otherwise she'll order him to put an end to his sister Erica. Seems like her contracts are quite powerful. While Veronica muses about family, the masked man appears before her. He tells her he's been looking for something and has to leave soon, but stays for tea with Veronica. She's delighted, but the masked man takes the opportunity to ask if Veronica has been feeling odd lately, like she's being controlled by someone. Veronica isn't sure, but mentions she sometimes hears a voice. It says, kill, and then I want to. The masked man is left speechless while Veronica begs him to stay longer. What is the relationship between these two characters? In Paralog 3, the masked man has found the information he was looking for. Thus, the kingdom's royalty came to carry the blood of the god, and a wicked god it was. The god had perished and yet lived on in this royal bloodline, warming through its veins. Generations of this family were made into the wicked god's puppets by blood. They were powerless to fight the corrupt influence that coursed in their flesh. The wicked god has been known by sundry names. Devourer of royals, ruin born upon wings, the original demon. But the god's true name has never been written until now. That name is... At this point, the passage ends to the frustration of the masked man. He says that he must hurry, not just for his sake, but for Veronica's sake too. At the end of Paralogue 3, Nino hands Alphonse a note from Zacharias. In the note, Zacharias tells Alphonse that he's sorry for leaving, but he's discovered a secret about the Amblin Empire's royal family. He is still investigating, but tells the gang that Veronica is not their enemy. The true villain is Bruno. The gang aren't sure who Bruno is, but Anna mentions she's heard of a Prince Bruno within the Amblian royalty. While still worried, the gang are happy to know Zacharias is alive. In Paralogue 5, the gang defeat Veronica in the Road of Shadows. The masked man appears by her side and tells them not to get in their way. One last warning before he's forced to kill them. Anna refuses, and the paralogue ends with a strange and unhinged response from the masked man. Something doesn't seem quite right with him. The main story returns to Book 1, Chapter 10 in the Road of Radiance. It is here that the masked man finally reveals himself to be Prince Bruno of Embla, and Veronica is his sister. At the end of the chapter, the gang head back to Asker after their victory, but before the summoner can follow them through the gateway, Veronica closes it off. She means to kill the summoner, but before she can, a mysterious light appears. A voice, claiming to be Zacharias, tells the summoner to run to the light and watch over Alphonse and the others. The Asker trio are glad to see the summoner safely returned, but are baffled by how Zacharias apparently saved them. The gang is happy that Zacharias is indeed safe, but wonder why he won't meet up with them. Anna says it's fine because she's got a sending stone from the Road of Radiance, and they can use it to talk to Zacharias with a magical rite in the Road of Shadows. Along the way, the gang find Bruno, who once again seems to be acting strange. He threatens to kill them if they get in his way. The gang make their way to the location of the right, but Bruno finds them. Alphonse points out that something is wrong with him, it's like he's not even the same person. After defeating Bruno, he tells Alphonse to kill him, but Alphonse refuses as he helped him out once before. Bruno says they're gonna regret that. 
The gang proceed with the Sending Stone right and call out to Zacharias. Nothing seems to happen and Bruno tells them they're wasting their time. Anna claims if Zacharias is alive, he should hear them no matter what. But Bruno reveals that Zacharias stuck his nose into things that he really should not have. Right before I came here, I killed him. According to Bruno, Zacharias is now dead. We get a slight break in the main story, but Xenologue 2 gives us a vital introduction to a new fake character. We see Bruno telling Veronica about the Tempest, a region of pure chaos that shouldn't exist, and a right to set it free. Veronica is interested, but asks Bruno who he actually is. She's figured out that he's a fake, because the real Bruno is off searching for something. Fake Bruno then shapeshifts into Sharena, then Alphonse, and finally Commander Anna. They reveal their name to be Loki and tells Veronica she'll have to wait to see what they really look like. What a tease. Loki talks about the Tempest right again, but Veronica is ready to proceed. This leads into the very first Tempest Trials event with Veronica as the boss. Back to the main story, the gang decided to return to the Road of Shadows to question Bruno. Did he really kill Zacharias? If he did, Alphonse cannot forgive him. The gang return and find Bruno still acting strange. He continues to threaten Alphonse and Sharena and even shows them Zacharias' lance as proof of his death. Bruno says Zacharias brought one of Embla's secrets into the light and begged for his life when he killed him. Despite his taunts, the gang defeat Bruno who once again tell them to kill him before they regret it. Alphonse is ready to do the deed this time but is stopped by the summoner. The summoner mentions that during the Sending Stone Rite, they possibly did talk with Zacharias. The only conclusion left, which is asked by Alphonse to Bruno, are you Zacharias? Before the concluding chapter, we have another break in Paralogue 10. This time, Princess Veronica is challenged by one of her contracted heroes, Seth, who asked, why does she insist on behaving like a child? Veronica responds, because there's a voice telling me to, and it tells me that I'm gonna have a lot of fun. A little concerning, but we know Bruno has been investigating this issue. Seth shares more criticism about Veronica as a leader, a ruler, must protect the people, and it's clear to Seth that Veronica does not act on their behalf. In the end, Seth does wish for Veronica to be a good ruler for her own citizens and herself. After this conversation, Veronica chats with Loki, still disguised as Anna. Veronica had obtained Nagelfar, and Loki mentions with it, her king's vessel will move. All that is left is to build a bridge over the southern sea. Some foreshadowing, but Veronica doesn't seem to care and asks if Loki's king is a good ruler. She's clearly hurt by Seth's words. Veronica quickly dismisses the thought though, and Loki tells us that in exchange for Veronica's hope, Loki's king will lend her his might. You really do want to see Asker and that summoner burn, don't you? In the final main story chapter, the gang has accepted that Bruno is indeed their lost friend, Zacharias. They question why he hid his identity and sided with Embla. They're able to chase after him and Zacharias, or Bruno, finally spills the beans. He tells them that those of Emblian royalty have cursed blood and eventually become puppets to the Dark God. Bruno tells the gang that he and his mother were despised by the royal family. They claimed his mother shared secrets with Asker. She was imprisoned and she eventually died. Bruno was then cast out to the border and that was when he assumed the identity of Zacharias, entered Asker and befriended Alphonse and Sharena. He did it all to destroy Embla. However, his cursed blood started to consume him and he thinks if he stayed by their side he would have eventually killed them. That is why he had left them and he's been trying to find a way to fight the curse. Before getting to talk more, Bruno is taken over with the curse's bloodlust and the gang have to fight him off. At the end of the chapter, Bruno tells Alphonse that he doesn't know when the curse will take him over and he can't resist it. He alludes to Veronica and their father, the Emperor, also being victims and the Dark God of Embla craves death and destruction for Asker. Bruno even states that he has tried to kill himself but cannot and asks Alphonse to kill him before he kills his friends. He has not found a cure for the curse and this is why Bruno has continuously told the gang to finish him off. He's been trying to get killed. After another skirmish, Bruno again tells Alphonse to kill him, but Alphonse refuses. He will not strike down a friend. Anna reaffirms that Zacharias was a member of the Order of Heroes and they won't give up on him. Sharena does ask Bruno to stay with them, but he refuses for fear of trying to kill them. Bruno is moved by the gang's words though, and he's going to resume his search for a cure. As a final send-off, Bruno asks the summoner to look over his friends. He makes a last request to put him down if he ever tries to kill Alphonse and Sharena again. 
That concludes the main story for book one, but there are additional moments of foreshadowing and teasing for book two. In Paralogue 13, Loki tells Veronica that she's had ample time to prepare for the right to construct a rainbow bridge. Soon, her king and his forces will invade. Hmm. In the intermission quest to unlock the weapon refinery, the summoner is greeted by Gunthra in their dreams. She tells us about Niffle, her younger sister Fjorm, and provides details on another right for us. This is a clear tease for book 2, but it can also be seen as Gunther building trust with the summoner. We learn a lot about the Asker vs Embla conflict, but in the end the war rages on. The general plot is that Embla's royalty is cursed by the blood of their god and they seemingly can't help but fight against Asker. We learn Princess Veronica and Bruno are siblings and Bruno is searching for answers about their curse. Bruno was cast out from the royal family because they accused his mother of treason. He assumed the Zacharias identity and entered Asker to plot revenge against Embla, but had to leave because the curse was taking him over. With the truth revealed, the Order of Heroes wants to help Bruno, who is resuming his search for a cure. There are quite a lot of loose ends which may finally be addressed in Book 6, 5 years later. Some questions I still have revolve around the nature of Asker and Embla. For example, Alfonso Sharina stated that the two nations are supposed to work in tandem with each other when they open and close gates, but it's never mentioned why they use the gateways in the first place. We also saw Zacharias or Bruno be able to open a gateway when he saved us from Veronica. This is never really addressed either, but it seems like in the Fey universe there are other ways to access gateways, so I wouldn't focus on this too much. Eventually in the story, everyone is kind of just warping all over the place. Well, this is the end of my book one recap. Before we head over to book two, I want to talk about Bruno and Veronica a bit more. In my next lore video, I want to go over their family relationship once again and discuss some issues I have with their supposed backstories. I'm hoping book 6 reveals more about Embla's royal family, but we can have some fun discussion before things really get going. I also want to do a fun where in the world is Bruno tracker because he sort of dips in and out of the main story. We already saw Bruno in book 6, so there's some relief he's at least still kicking. Thank you for sticking around and I hope you enjoyed this video. I will see you in the next one.